Good morning. Welcome to Tri-State Worship Center, where we encourage the saint, help the hurting, embrace all people. We're excited to have you with us this morning, excited to see what the Lord has in store. I guess I got to keep talking while Ramonda's talking to Vicki, because it's her turn to talk now. Hello. Hey. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ramonda. Thanks, Ramonda. Um, if you are a first-time guest at Tri-State Worship Center, in your bulletin, is a welcome card, a guest card, connection card, whatever you want to call it. If you will fill that out and put it in uh, either one of the uh, mailboxes on the wall or take it out to the Connection Center on the other side of that wall. We have a gift for you, and we want to thank you for stopping by Tri-State Worship Center. We don't take up an offering. We don't pass the hat, if you will, but we do uh, need you to be faithful in your giving with your tithe, your offering, your building fund commitments, as well as your missions giving. So we ask you to drop those into the boxes that are located throughout the building on the wall, or you can text to give at 740-370-4342, or you can swipe your card at our kiosk out in the foyer, or you can go to TSWC.org, but we do ask you to be faithful in your giving so that we can continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. 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 Grab your phones, go to TSWC, and that is our public page. And if you would like and share that, then that way your friends and family can join us in service this morning. Also, uh, on October the 19th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. will be a shoebox training. I'm assuming it's here at the church. See Vicki Edwards for details. For details. <laughs> and then also... Uh, our altar ministry, which is a group of people that feel uh, the call to pray with people, especially people that respond uh, during our service and at the end of service, they're going to have a little training session on October the uh, 26th from 9 to 12, from 9 in the morning till noon. Deb Wilson is in charge of our altar ministry. So if you're interested in joining that group, if you feel a call to pray with people, uh, we encourage you to attend that training session, and Deb, wave at us real quick. Deb's right back there. If you don't know who Debbie is, just uh, see her and sign up to be at that training time. We'd appreciate it. And you got one hand clap of uh, appreciation from Jonathan Childers. Okay, prayer request today. Kevin Roach, uh, the Pete Smith family. Pete yeah. Smith passed. Pete passed yesterday. I did not realize that, so let's remember their family. Laura Keaton, Mary Horn, Larry Medcalf is back in the hospital. We need to remember him. Also, Stacy, uh, Carrie Johnson, uh, Dennis Hogsett, Hunter Triplett. Uh, Hunter Triplett, yes, he's been on our prayer list for a while. And I had messaged his mother and I said, How's Hunter doing? And she sends me a uh, picture and he's up on a telephone pole back to work. So I guess he's doing pretty good. We'll, we'll take him off there. <laughs> yeah, we can take him off. Uh, Zane McFarland, Danny Tom Thomas, Nancy Lucas's mom, her name is Doris, Max Shope, Debbie Kinsler, Karen Fisher, Jean and Hilda, Beth Bloomfield, Holly Pritchard, Mary Plaster, Matthew McDonald, Angela Robertson, Sam and Alec Barker, and Sue Lettingham. Amen. Let's stand. If you have a special need this morning, can you just raise your hand up to let people know that you have a need? Look around. Look around. Everybody look around real quick. Look. Lots of needs. We serve a big God. Amen. Let's invite him to be with us today and take care of those needs. Lord, we thank you today for this day. This is the day that you've made for us. We're going to make the choice to rejoice and be glad in it. We're thankful that we can come into your house and gather together, present to you our needs, to worship you, and then to have our hearts challenged by your word. God, we stand on your word believing today that you are the God that's able to do all things. And we present to you the needs that we've mentioned here this morning. Those that we read, those who are represented by an uplifted hand, those that are on the prayer list in the bulletin. We know that you can reach down from the throne room and bring healing. So we ask you to do that and let us hear testimonies of how you touched your people. God, we pray today you'll bless the offering, bless those who give. Multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom. God, so that we can further the good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ into a lost and dying world. So now, today, right now, this moment, let everything that we do, every word that's spoken, every song that's sang, every action that's taken, let us point somebody to Jesus Christ. We love you, we bless you, we praise you, for it is in Christ's name that we pray. Someone shout amen. Let me just remind you quickly about the shoebox training this coming Saturday and the altar ministry training next Saturday. Interested in either one of those, see Vicki Edwards for the shoebox and see Deb Wilson 
for the altar ministry. If you'll come back tonight at 6, I'm going to um, look at the third. <laughs> Everything all right over there? Whew. You got to say, hey, she's been that way. She's been destructive. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. We love Linda. We pray for Linda and her family. Uh, we're going to do sermon number three in a series that uh, I've called Turn, remembering our foundations, getting back to who we are as believers in Christ and getting uh, not just ourselves, but our family, our community, our country, uh, all those areas back to the foundation. So if you come back at six, we're going to worship again together, spend some time in his word. This morning, I want to uh, continue a series that we've titled Free at Last. Free at last, understanding and experiencing true freedom through our identity in Christ. We just have a lot of believers and unbelievers who are living life based on what everybody else is telling them, who are allowing everybody else to dictate to them who they are. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we are free when we realize who we are in Christ, not according to anything else other than him. We've been using Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 as our uh, keynote verse. Read now the King James Version. It says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, free from the dominion of sin. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The New Living Translation talks about that yoke of bondage and calls it uh, this not being uh, caught up again in slavery to the law. It says, so Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again into slavery to the law. And rather than go through every week as a review, let me just sum all the things that we've talked about. Let me just sum them up in one statement. And here it is. God wants his people to be free. The devil wants people to be in bondage. That's really, that's really what we're talking about. To be free at last is to understand that God wants you to be free, but the devil wants you to be in bondage. And to be uh, able to walk in that freedom and in that liberty, we need to know who we are in Christ. And that really takes three main ingredients before we get into this morning's topic. One of those ingredients is the truth. Listen to me. The truth is the truth whether anybody believes it or not. A lie is still a lie even if everybody believes it. We need the truth. What's the truth? The truth is God's word. Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Romans chapter 3 verse 4. Let God be found true. Every man be found a liar. We need the truth in our life. And we don't need uh, uh, other people's opinions. We don't need other people's uh, commentary. What we need is his truth. The second thing we need in our life to be able to walk in that freedom is grace. God's favor poured out on undeserving people. God's favor poured out on undeserving people. And the third element that we need is faith. Faith is simply believing that God will tell the truth. Regardless of what you see, regardless of what you feel, that God is telling the truth. Remember, we all have a measure of faith. It's not about how much more faith you can have. We all have a measure of faith. The real issue is, is what is the object of your faith? If your faith is in Jesus Christ, guess what? You can walk with boldness and truth and grace because the object of my faith is Christ. But if the object of your faith is something less than that, then you're probably not going to live the overcoming life that he came to give us. And so if we have the truth, if we have grace and we have faith, then we can begin to understand what it is to live in freedom, which leads me to what I want to talk to us about this morning, which is probably my favorite topic, whether I'm teaching or preaching, and that is reprogramming your mind, reprogramming your mind. Lord, help us this morning. So thankful that we could gather and just worship you and praise you in spirit and in truth. So thankful for uh, us to be able to stand by faith, knowing that you are a good, good God, that you're a faithful God, that no matter what the circumstance is in life, no matter what we see, no matter what we feel, no matter what we touch, If we can walk knowing that you are the God who delivers us, the God that empowers us, the God that loves us, the God that sets us free, the God that heals us, if we can walk in that truth, we walk in freedom. So help us this morning, Lord God, as we look at another aspect of walking in that liberty that you've given us. I thank you for that. Ask it in Christ's name. Someone say amen. Amen. The communist government of China has been in the news a lot this past week or two. And while I do not want to dip my toe 
into the political stream of communism or China, I do want to talk about a special labor camp that the communist China people have for political and religious people whose thinking and whose ideas are considered a threat to their way of life. Let me make sure you understand what I'm talking about. There is a prison camp, a labor camp in China where people go to spend time whose ideas and philosophies oppose the Chinese communist way of life. It's called a, it's called a labor camp. And in that camp, as we speak, there are a number of pastors, a number of Christian leaders that are in that camp, even as we stand here this morning in, in October of 2019. And some of them have been there for a lot of years. The Chinese have an interesting term for the process that takes place in this labor camp. Remember why these people are here. These people are here because they think differently than what communist China wants them to think. And so they send them to labor camps. And in their labor camps, they do a thing called re-education through labor. They want to re-educate these people. And they're going to re-educate them by causing them to labor until they finally change their mind to do something until they finally think differently. And it's really a pitiful euphemism uh, for an attempt to break prisoners down. It's really a bad way to do it. Physically, they reprogram them through work and through propaganda. Now, while that's a bad idea, it, it is an idea that in reality is taught in the Word of God. Obviously, the communist China use it for wicked, evil ways, but God wants to use it for a way that will help us to be able to walk in the freedom that he wants us to walk in. The principle is this. If you want people to think in new ways and in different categories, you have to erase the old ways of thinking from their minds. Their minds must be reprogrammed. Now listen, we already have a, um, um, some people in the community who think we're a cult. So those of you that are watching by Facebook Live, this might give you uh, fodder for your fight that, uh, that we are a cult, but I'm here to tell you we are not a cult, but I do know this. If I continue to try to live as a believer with my old mindset, it will not work. It will not work. I cannot say I believe and I want to follow Christ and I want to do the things of God and somehow reach back and still live the way that I used to live and think the way that I used to think. It will not work. And if I'm going to change the way I live, nothing changes until I change the way I think. Three amens. It's belief plus believer that determines behavior. You cannot behave your way into a belief system. It will never work. There are world religions out there that try it and it doesn't work. But when I tie what I believe to my spirit and my soul, then it dictates how I behave. And let me just be honest with us. There are a lot of believers who confess Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life, but they've never allowed reprogramming of their mind to take place, and they still live in a way and think in a way that they used to. There's a problem with that. You'll never walk in the liberty and the freedom that he has set before us if we think that way. Hang with me for just a minute. If we're going to be new people, if we're going to be new believers... If we're going to follow Christ, we have to think differently than we used to. In case you haven't noticed, it's easier said than done. So let's go to Romans chapter 12. Look at the second verse, the second verse of Romans chapter 12. And here's what it says. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by attending church more regularly and paying tithes and reading at least a chapter a day and praying for an hour a day so that you might prove what the will of God is. Your Bible doesn't say that? I must have that communist China Bible. What's it say? Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Don't give in to the matrix, but be transformed by changing the way you think. Nothing in life, listen to me, nothing in life is going to change until you change the way you think. Then you'll be able to prove what the will of God is. The number one battlefield 
is our minds. The number one battlefield that the enemy wants to attack is your mind. There's not a sin that's committed that does not first begin with a thought. No one commits a sin and then wakes up, I must have been in a coma. I didn't even know what I was doing. No. If he can get us to think a thought, he can get us to do a deed. Amen, Pastor Terry. Well, thank you. That's that's nice of you. Go back a couple chapters. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 5 and 6. Of Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Here's the parameters for this battle that I'm talking about. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature, remember what we've been set free from? You've been given liberty by Jesus Christ so that you are no longer uh, tied to the dominion of sin. You're set free from the dominion of sin. Yet, just a few chapters before, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Look at me for just a minute. If the Bible puts our mindsets into two categories, guess what I believe? I believe there are two categories of mindset that are existing in the world today. One of them is when we have our minds set on the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the things of my sinful nature. And then I have another category that says I'm going to fix my mind on the things of God. Is everybody listening? Say amen. Amen. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Look at me. A lot of people think it's okay to have your minds controlled by the sinful nature because they've never seen anyone drop dead from doing that. That's not what it means. The mind controlled by the sinful nature leads to death, meaning separation from God. It is so crucial for you to hear that because if you don't hear that, the rest of this is not going to make sense. When I allow myself to be controlled, I'm not saying I never give in to it, but when I allow myself to be controlled by my sinful nature, it brings separation from God. Separation from God is death. Two people believe that. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life. What did Jesus come that we might have? Life and have it abundantly. But it not only leads to life, it leads to peace. If you look at the Greek word there, it's the word for tranquility. So you can ask yourself a question real quick before I go for another two hours here. (laughs) Am I living in peace? Or does there seem to be this turmoil and this up and down and this battle going on because the mind controlled by the world by the sinful nature is going to lead me to separation from God but if I allow my mind to be controlled by the spirit of God which let me just pause and pump the brakes long enough to say if the Bible says we can do it we must be enabled to do it the Bible doesn't tell us to do something and then God step back and go (laughs) punk no if it's in there we can do it So if it says the mind controlled by the sinful nature or the mind controlled by the Spirit of God, then we must be able to have our minds controlled by one or the other. Everybody with me say, "Uh uh-huh. These two forces are at work. Look at Galatians chapter 5. It talks about how these forces are at work against each other. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say, ooh, me, me, me. But I wonder how many people this morning have felt that, even today. Oh, oh, I, I, should do, I want to do this, but I should do that. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting. These two forces are constantly opposing each other, one trying to overtake the other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. They're at at war with each other, 
And if the sinful nature wins, you're not going to be able to carry out the good intentions. Christians who do not learn to live by the Spirit, listen carefully, and continue to try to live by the flesh, it will kill your joy, it will kill your victory, it will kill your peace. The difference between the perpetual believer who lives in victory and the perpetual believer who lives in defeat is the believer who allows their mind to be controlled by the things of the spirit versus the things of the flesh. What the brain is to the body, when my brain tells my hand to pick something up, what the brain is to the body, that's what the, the, the spirit is to the mind. That's what the soul is to the mind. When I listen to the spirit of God rather than the flesh or the sinful nature... My desires and my heart, my passions, they all change. They're not what they used to be. It's called the control center. And there's a very familiar passage. If you've been in church at all, you know this passage. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it's verses 3 through 5. And here's how it reads. We are human. Look at your neighbor. Confirm that with them. You are human. Some of you weren't sure. You turned and went. (laughs) We are human, but we don't wage war like humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. Look at me. uh, Sinful nature, spirit nature, godly weapons, fleshly weapons. Are you seeing that there's a complete chasm here that separates these two? Not worldly weapons. And we use them to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. This is, this is probably going to end up being sermon A and sermon B next week because I don't think I'm going to get through this. The, the biggest problem that you and I have, and well, I shouldn't say that. One of the biggest problems that you and I have in serving the Lord is this thing called reason. Because we want everything to make sense. We want everything to be rational and logical. Because in our human thinking, that's the way it's supposed to be. But I don't know if you heard this yet or not, but his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So we use these weapons to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture those rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. That's reading it out of the New Living Translation. And while God's weapons are our weapons, those weapons that God has for us are not as readily available as the weapons of the sinful nature. I know that, that rubs some of you the wrong way. But but just hear me out for just a second. See, if I don't train myself to immediately grab God's weapons, my go-to is going to be my sinful nature weapons. That's why I'm saying they're not as easily available because I've got to train myself to go for those and not go for those. What are those fleshly weapons? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. And he's, he's going to list them out for you. Ready? Here they are, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, look at me. King James Version uses the word lasciviousness right there, which is a word we don't preach anymore in church because we don't like what it means. But what it means is that if I do something that causes Ramonda to sin, I'm just as guilty as she is. So if I dress in a way that causes someone else to lust, which I would never do, no matter how I dress, but (laughs) ladies, when you dress in a way that leaves nothing to the imagination and it causes someone to lust, you're just as guilty as they are. No, you, no, you didn't like it. Golf clap. That's nice. Let's get on to the next hole. 
Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness or lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, outbursts of wrath, outbursts of wrath. It's in my Bible three times. Selfish ambitions, (laughs) dissensions. Look at me. King James Version says strife. You know what that is? Causing factions or partisanship in the church. heresies, those things that are untrue. Remember what we're talking We're talking about what's available to us right away. If I don't like what Pastor Terry's saying or leading, well, I will just cause strife. And that's easy to do because I can get to that quickly. Whereas God says, obey those that are over you in the Lord, make their ministry easy, not a burden. For what benefit would that be to you, the Bible says? Wouldn't be any benefit to you. Envy, murders. I'm not going to ask if we have any murderers in the house this morning. But the devil knows that he's not going to tempt some of you to murder somebody. You might think it, but you ain't going to do it. But he will cause you to do one of these other things. Drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have also told you in the times past, listen, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. Not Pastor Terry's words, the Bible. Those people who have a go-to that's listed in those 17 things, those 17 weapons that are of the sinful nature... If that's your go-to and you practice those things, those people will not have a place in the kingdom of God. 17 of them, readily available. They really feel like that they're available there so that we can grab them to defend ourselves. But that is not why they're there. That is not why they're there. Listen, worse... If those are the patterns in our life that continue uninterrupted, if those 17 things continue in our life as a pattern that is uninterrupted, we are sinning. We're not serving. We're sinning. So what do we do? Why is it so hard for me to think differently? Why is it so hard for me to break away from that? Well, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This time I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. For though we walk, for though we move through life in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It's so hard for us to think differently because we don't believe that scripture. Now, Pastor Terry, we, we can't really bring every thought captive. If you just got here in the last five minutes, a little while ago I stood here and said, if the Bible tells us to do something, we must be enabled to do it. We must have the power to do it. And when the Bible says to take every thought captive, guess what some of us should be busy doing? Taking those thoughts captive, especially the ones right now that some of you are having that Pastor Terry's a mean guy. I'm not. (laughs) Take that captive under the obedience of Christ, all right? So it's hard for us to think differently because my battles are not primarily physical battles. My battles are primarily spiritual battles. Can I get an amen? amen? Because my weapons are not readily accessible. I have to train myself for the godly weapons, but these weapons of the flesh, of the sinful nature, they're so readily available. Don't tell me you've never said something and then thought, man, I wish I hadn't said that. That's, that's what I'm talking about. They're so readily available. Right there, just grab them. And you think you're doing it to defend yourself, but you're not. And if it practices that way in your life uncontrolled, then you're sinning. Because my strongholds, they're not easily destroyable. Help me, Lord. You know, Doc, it hurts when I do this. We'll quit doing that. I can't seem to get away from the addictive behavior. 
Well, what'd you do last night? Well, I went around where that addictive behavior is going on. It's like, walk into this. <laughs> you, you can't keep doing what you did expecting that somehow it's going to be different this time. It doesn't work that way. So how do we reprogram our minds? I, I know that's a question on your heart right now. As pastor, tell us, please tell us how we can reprogram our minds. Look at verse 5. We just read it this time. I'll read it from the New American Standard Version. It says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. How do I reprogram myself? We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, I don't like what Pastor Terry's preaching right now. Take that thought captive and take it to Christ and say, is he telling me the truth? See, you have to... You have to get to a place where you can sort those thoughts out. Uh, why do we? Why are we commanded to take every thought captive? Well, simple, because not every thought comes to God, comes from God. I know people will will take me to task on this, and I have had people argue with me about this. But I don't believe that there are neutral thoughts. I think our thoughts come from one of two places: they're going to come from the enemy, or they're going to come from God. You know, the example that I always use is the alarm clock in the morning that you set at six o'clock or whatever time you get up and your first thought is, I don't want to get up. And I would ask you, does God want you to feel that way? Does God, is that the thought God put in your mind? God said, you don't really want to get up. You know what? I don't really want to get up. I think the Lord wants me to stay in bed and lose my job. We give in to it, but it's not God. You've got to take that thought captive. You've got to begin to sort those thoughts out because not every thought, it comes from God. And when a thought comes, we have two choices. I know that in sermons past, I've given you four choices, but really it's two choices. And here it is. You either capture it and destroy it or you accept it and act on it. Capture and destroy, accept and act. What, Lord? You want me to give $100 an offering? Accept it and act. Don't capture and destroy. Everybody with me? I see those $100 offerings. Thank you, Lord. Listen to me. Listen. You can say, well, you know what? I believe the Lord's telling me this. But if you say, I believe the Lord's telling me this, and it's followed by, but... What's getting ready to come behind that is a lie. I believe that the Lord wants to work all things for my good, but whatever's coming after that is going to be a lie. I either believe him or I don't believe him. And remember, if we're going to walk by faith, it's walking as though God's telling me the truth, that no weapon formed against me can prosper, that he's working all things for my good, that I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That I am healed, but no, whatever's going to come after the but is going to be a lie. Whatever comes after the but's going to be a lie. And we have to learn to separate those things. We've got to learn to somehow get them and, and, and grab them and take them captive under Christ Jesus. And say, Lord, you tell me what to do right here. Listen, I heard a preacher recently who had planted a church that's, that's grown into a very, very large church. And he, he planted the church in 2007. In 2010, he hit a wall. In 2010, he hit a wall that was so hard, he could barely get in the pulpit. He walked up to the platform one day, got behind the pulpit, and was having such a panic attack that he thought he was dying. And, and I'm not, when I say that, I'm not just being rhetorical or fictitious. He thought he was dying. And matter of fact, 90% of the people that go to the hospital think they're having a heart attack. What they're having is a panic attack. Uh, Karen Wood or some of you other nurses, you can confirm that for me later. All right. And so he, he, he got here. He excused himself, told his wife, he, he said, I need to get to the hospital. I'm dying. I'm dying. Goes to the hospital. They say, you're not having a heart attack. It's a panic attack. So guess what happened the next time he started to approach the pulpit? Another panic attack. Why? Because he associated the panic with the pulpit. 
The last time I got to the pulpit, I had a panic attack, so I better not go over there again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but whatever's coming behind the butt's a lie. But if I get up there, I'm going to have another panic attack. Are, are you listening this morning? Am I just talking to myself? Once it's discovered that he's having this panic attack, guess what he's got to do? He's got to think differently. That pulpit had nothing to do with a panic attack. It's an inanimate object. Now, you can go casting demons out of it all day long, but that did not cause the panic attack. The enemy caused the panic attack with a thought. Now, listen, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Sometimes we need medicine. Hallelujah. All good things come from above. And if medicine makes you cool, hallelujah. Just don't take too much of it. You don't want to be too cool, but take as much as you need to be cool. Dr. Terry. You got to sort out the thoughts. The second thing you got to do, I got to quit here in a minute, is you got to get the facts straight. You got to get the facts straight. Listen, the solution to the problem of wrong thinking is not found on earth. Amen. Hallelujah. The solution to wrong thinking is not found down here. It's not going to be found with Oprah, Dr. Phil. None of those guys. Nope, not going to happen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Here it is. Turn to your phones. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, remember, if the word therefore is there, you need to find out what it's there for. If you have been raised up with Christ, there's the if. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking those things that are where? Well, that ain't down here. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. This ain't heaven. Keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seating, seated at the right hand of God. How can we keep seeking the things that are above? Well, you've got to read the next verse. Are you ready? Verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Well, I believe all things are going to work out for my good, but no. What, what you're getting ready to do is listen to a lie that's here on this earth. What you need to do is capture that and destroy that, accept the thought that God gives you that says, listen, you're my child. I'm going to take care of you. You're my child. I'm not going to let you fail. It may feel like failure, but we were never told to measure our life by our feelings. Never. Help me, Lord. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are here on this earth. Live life as though God is telling you the truth. Believe God's word even when it contradicts how you feel or what you see. Believe God's word. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. No matter what they tell you at school, fearfully and wonderfully made. They can say whatever they want to say. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, and you're kind of cute. Doesn't that make us feel better? Where'd it come from? God's word. Not the cute part, but fearfully and wonderfully made part. But she is cute. So this goes back to an earlier sermon when we talked about that struggle that we find ourselves in when we face what we see and what we feel versus what God has told us. What we see and what we feel versus what God has told us. And what we've got to do at that moment is we've got to believe God's word regardless of what we feel, regardless of what we see, regardless of what it might look like. I'm going to believe God's word. Here's the lie. The lie is the enemy will say to some of you, well, I'm just an angry person. I can't help exploding when I'm crossed. I can't, ex I can't help exploding when things don't go the way I think they should go. That is a lie. Here's the truth. I'm a new person in Christ and not in the bondage to my anger anymore. That's the truth. I'm trying, Jonathan, but before I knew Christ, man, I could cuss good. I was a good cusser. I knew all the words. And I knew how to string them together to make you feel like nothing. 
Guess what? I don't do that no more. Aren't you glad? Before I came to know Jesus, I was an awful person. Awful. What do you don't know, Jonathan? <laughs> Shut up, Jonathan. Yeah. You ain't heard that in a while, have you? Yeah. Biggest response of the morning. Shut up, Jonathan. <laughs> I just was, I, listen, I would fight. I, 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 I drank and I did the drugs and I did all that stuff. Guess what? I don't do that no more. Somebody, somebody was like, it's the first time we've heard that. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Listen, because my power over the devil is not a power encounter. It's a truth encounter. You should write that down. It's not a power encounter. It's a truth encounter. What did Jesus say? You will know the truth and the truth will set you Listen, he didn't say you will hear the truth. He said you will know the truth. How do I know the truth? you got to let it travel 18 inches. Well, it's a little shorter for some of you. From here to here. We know God, but it's not until we know God that it changes who we are. You've heard me say it before. I know Chad Pennington. i got a football in my office signed by him. I had a class with him at Marshall. I know what you're thinking. I think he's younger than you. You'd be right. I started my college education at the tender age of 36. Every time I walked into the room, I thought I was a teacher. I said, no, I'm just here to learn with you. I know who Chad Pennington is. He signed two footballs for me. I gave one to my daughter, Holly, who was a cheerleader out Wayne at the time, and they auctioned that one off, raffled it off. And I kept one and put it in my office. Actually, I, when I asked him, I, have to, I guess I have to be honest about this. I said, can you sign a football for my daughter? She's cheerleader, blah, 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 blah. He goes, yeah, sure. Just drop it off at the facilities building. Put your name on there, and I'll sign it. Well, I didn't just take one. I took two. Kept one for myself. Um, wouldn't you? Yeah. All right, then. I wasn't so bad. It's not just hearing the truth, but it's knowing that it's not hearing about Chad Pennington and sitting in a, in a, in, at a desk next to him. I didn't know him. I knew his name. I knew he was the quarterback of the team. That's all I knew about him. He was smart, really smart. And you know what? He was always at class early. Now, I had classes with other football players, not, not so much. Matter of fact, I had a few other football players in classes that I had to help them just find their way to class. I mean... <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, Dennis. I, I, you're not your, it would never be your grandson. It would it never. He's at WVU, not at Marshall. I, I went to Marshall. I waited for a little bit of applause about Marshall. Never mind. Okay. So it's knowing the truth, not hearing the truth, not being around the truth, not living with someone who has the truth, not because mommy and daddy knew the truth. It's knowing the truth that sets me free. Sets me free from what? Simple way of life. Simple nature. Knowing Jesus sets me free from that and brings his weapons closer to me. And so I don't reach real quickly to the old weapons anymore. I'm not going to stand here and say I never reach to those old weapons, and you can't say it either, because we do. But we should more and more be reaching for the godly weapons. How do you do it? You've got to fix your mind on those things which are above. Linda, you should probably come. Let, let me put it to you this way. Some of you can identify with this. Imagine, if you would, that you were being audited by the IRS. Yeah, see, I knew, I knew some of you identify with that. And, and here's what the auditor says to you, okay? He looks at you and he says, well, seems like everything adds up, looks to be in order, but I'm going to charge you for back taxes and penalties and fees anyway because I have a feeling, I have a feeling that you didn't pay enough taxes. What are you going to say to that guy? I don't care how you feel, <laughs> right? You're going to say, listen, how you feel is irre irrelevant to this audit. I don't care how you feel. It's not about that. The fact is that you said my tax return looked good and that everything was accurate. And so I don't owe anything. Why can't we do that when the enemy comes our way? It says, but don't you feel this? Don't you feel Listen. 
My feelings are irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Because if I know the truth, that's what sets me free. It's not knowing the circumstance is good. It's not knowing that what I see is good. It's knowing the truth. But some of you probably look at that auditor and say, well, now how long have you been feeling this way? Right? Where, were you raised to feel this way about taxes? Did something happen to you when you were a child that caused you to live by your feelings towards taxes rather than the facts? Listen, you wouldn't say that. You would demand that the auditor bring his feelings in line with the facts. Man, that was good. You would demand that that auditor bring his feelings in line with the facts. Don't misunderstand, don't misunderstand me. Listen, I'm not discounting the fact that sometimes we, we need help dealing with the past. I'm not, you know, if that auditor got hurt when he was a child and therefore he's going to take it out on everybody else, he probably needs to see somebody, okay? He, he might need some help. But here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not living in the past, but learning from the past. Paul said, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm done. Paul didn't say that. I'm saying, I'm done. Ephesians chapter 4. In reference to your former manner of life, in reference to the way that you used to live, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust and of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I love that. You're not renewed by how good you are. You're not renewed by how much you give. You can try. Please try to give your way to being good. Please try it. Start today. No, it's by changing your thinking. Renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We must have the ability to do that. We must be enabled and empowered to do that or it wouldn't be in there. Here's a simple, another simple illustration. We're going to pray. Have I said that yet? Did I say we were going to pray yet? Well, that was just the first time. I usually say it five times. I, I didn't get into a whole lot of fights growing up because I was usually bigger than everybody else. I outgrew my older brother by the time I was probably in second or third grade. I just have always been a big guy. But there was this one guy in the sixth grade who was bigger than me, and he was a bully. And, and I think he was 18, <laughs> still in the sixth grade. I'm pretty sure third grade was the worst three years of his life. I don't know, but he's, he was a big guy, so I was afraid. So my feeling, listen, was that I was in trouble. That was my feeling. Right, follow me on this. We're going to pray. My feeling was I'm in trouble. This, guy, this guy's going to get me. Until I realized a fact, one fact, I could outrun him. And that I only lived two blocks from school. You know what I did? Ran home. Got home, ran in the house, heart's pounding, right? Because I think maybe he's chasing me. But then there was another fact that kicked in. It's my house. He ain't coming in here. And so the heart kind of calmed down a little bit more until the third fact kicked in. You know what the third fact was? My dad was home. Are, anybody catching this? And you know what, all of a sudden, I was like, yeah, that's my house. Yeah. You want to come in here? Come on. Right? All of a sudden, things changed. Why? Because I, I left my feelings and went with the facts. The fact was, I was faster, I was home, and my dad was there. Stand with me. Here's the question. Is the devil chasing you? Listen to me. He's a liar. He is the father of all lies. He originates lies. The fact is, you are a child of the king. If you are a believer this morning, you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Those things that were meant to harm you are going to turn out for your good. When I know that, it changes the way I live. It changes who I am. Bow your heads. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word Thank you for your word that is the fact that we don't have to go by our feelings. We can go with the facts. The fact is you loved us.
You loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us that if we would believe on him, if we would know that truth, that we wouldn't have to perish, but we'd have everlasting life. That if we could just simply confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, we could be saved. Your word tells us that. Your word tells us that you are our protector and our healer and our deliverer. You are our provider. You're everything that we need you to be. You are the great I am. But Lord, we have to accept and act on that. We have to begin to walk that way and not let the things of this life, not let the sinful nature rise up. So give us that courage. Give us that strength. Give us that power. I thank you for that. I thank you for that, Lord. You're so awesome. You're such a great God. We love you and we bless you. We thank you for your word. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe you did that at one time, fell away from it. Maybe you've never made a commitment to Christ. You need to believe the fact. And the fact is, he came, he died, he was buried, he rose again, all so that you could be forgiven for sin and have eternity with him. That's the only reason he did it. So that we can be forgiven, so that he can become the supreme sacrifice for the things that we've done wrong. And all we have to do is accept that and act on it. Accept it and act on it. So as they sing, if that's you this morning, would you come and let me pray with you this morning? Come on, do it right now. Don't wait. Everybody, let's sing it together. All my life, All Lord. My life. at me. Set your mind on those things which are above. Turn the TV on, bad news. I don't care what channel you watch, it's bad news. But you know what? Jesus is coming back. Someday soon, he will split the eastern skies and he will come back for us. There's some good news. Why don't you act on that and, and just destroy this other thought? Why don't you act on the fact that you know that he loves you so much, he takes us just the way we are. But he loves us too much to leave us that way. He's going to change us. And he loves us. He loves us. He loves you. He loves to hear your voice. If he had a wallet, your picture would be in it. If he had a refrigerator, he'd have a magnet over your face. I mean, hanging your picture up there. But he loves us. So let's set our minds on those things. Amen? Amen. What a great addition to our praise team we've had recently. Come back tonight at 6. We're going to talk about turn. If you're going the wrong direction, you need to turn and return to the foundations of what you first believe. Return to your first love. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you tonight at 6.